Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. In every country with available data, trans populations are among the most at risk groups for HIV. Despite this, trans communities are frequently excluded from national data collection efforts and or are unacknowledged as priority populations by national governments in their HIV responses. As a result, meaningful inclusion of trans people in national strategic plans is rare and this exclusion continues to contribute to poor HIV related health outcomes and to comparatively low levels of trans specific funding and programming. Gate and Amfar have joined in a collaboration to explore how to increase the meaningful engagement of trans people in national strategic plan development. Meaningful engagement is crucial to end the epidemics. As World AIDS Day 2021 team states, end the inequalities and AIDS and pandemics. We will also be joined uh, by, speak, by invited speakers from the Global Fund, Fem Alliance Uganda, and UNAIDS to discuss the importance of trans inclusion in NSPs in order to reach populations most at risk of HIV and ultimately achieve country level epidemic control. Welcome. If you have any questions during the webinar, please put them on the chat and uh, we will make sure the panelists answer your questions. Um, we're gonna start today with Elise and Jennifer, who's gonna present about the systematic review, what were the findings? Jennifer and Elise, please. Great, wonderful, thank you. Can you... Uh... Can you see my screen? Good. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, great. Good. Um, well, thank you. Um, so thanks, Erica. I'm, I'm Jennifer Sherwood. I'm the public policy manager at AMFAR, the Foundation for AIDS Research based here in DC. Uh, today I'm here with my colleague Elise and we are looking forward to presenting some of the results. Uh, from a recent systematic review that we conducted looking at the level of trans inclusion uh, in HIV national strategic plans. So we have, we, we've known for a, a long time that, that trans populations are at higher risk of HIV. Uh, every systematic review that comes out, all UNAIDS data, um, which is pictured here, um, shows that in, in every country that we have data, we find really high rates of HIV among trans people. And, um, and of course we know that uh, there's a lot of gray boxes on this uh, map here too, um, and that those countries are not countries that don't have trans people at high risk of HIV, but in fact represent that our data systems are, um, are lacking. So despite this uh, epidemiological reality that, uh, that trans people have not been, um, that are at high risk of HIV, we, we also know that trans people have not been adequately prioritized in the HIV response, um, nor, in, um, nor in HIV policy, including in national strategic plans. And uh, NSPs are, uh, are important. Um, they are important policy documents that help identify what the strategy for HIV is going to be, including which populations are prioritized, which strategies are prioritized. Um, they outline a national, uh, national targets and indicators. Um, to track progress. Um, they also in can include budgets, which show where the money is going to go. Um, and they're not just, uh, they're not just words. Um, they are used and they're used um, also by international funders, uh, including the Global Fund and others to help make decisions. So they're, they're not, they're not just, uh, um, they're not, yeah, they're not just plans. They do, they do have actionable points. So, um, so trans inclusion in these plans is, uh, is important. Um, it's, it's good HIV policy and it's epidemiologically sound. 
Uh, but we know that it's far from universal. And so we set out to, um, to assess the quality of trans inclusion in the countries, uh, in the world's most um, high prevalence countries. And, uh, and I will turn it over to Elise to talk through what we did and what we found. Thank you. Next slide, I guess. There we go. All right, so I will jump right into the methods for our review. So overall, we wanted to really include NSPs from diverse contexts. Uh, so we picked the highest prevalence countries from the five UN AIDS regions that are most impacted by HIV. So we were working with 60 NSPs overall for our review. Um, we went through each of those documents to look for trans-specific inclusion in each of the five key sections. And we wanted to really go beyond, you know, are trans people mentioned in any way in those sections to try and measure the extent and quality of inclusion. Um, so for example, when we were looking at the EPI data, we wanted to see, is there both prevalence data and size estimate data? Because both are different and important in different ways um, for strategic planning and program planning. Um, we also looked at things like where trans inclusion was occurring, is it happening across the whole continuum of care or is it really just focused on prevention and there's nothing about trans retention in care? Um, and then finally, we wanted to look at are trans people being listed on their own or are they sort of being mentioned in just an umbrella of key populations? Or more specifically, are they being grouped with men who have sex with men? Um, which is really important, uh, I think, given the global HIV community's historical pattern of grouping MSM and trans women together, um, which really results in, in subpar HIV programming, given the, the really distinct experiences and, and vulnerabilities of both of those groups. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so overall, we found that 65% of the NSPs we reviewed um, mentioned trans people at any point in the document. So that means about a third of the NSPs we looked at had absolutely no mention of trans people anywhere. We did find that about 8% of the NSPs included trans people in all five of the key sections that we looked at. And then if you go ahead and look at sort of the breakdown of where inclusion was happening in those key sections, uh, you can see that trans inclusion occurred most often um, in the narrative section and least often in the budget section, which with only 13% um, of NSPs mentioning trans people in the budget. And then for those of you all who may be interested in the regional context of our results, overall, we really found that the Asia and the Pacific region generally outperformed all other regions, um, though Latin America and the Caribbean did really well in a few select sections, um, primarily, primarily in the narrative inclusion section. Um, next slide, please. And so here's some more specific results. Um, this is a map of the Eastern and Southern Africa region. Um, and you can see where sections are listed under a country name. That means they did have trans specific inclusion in those sections of their narrative. Um, so I think it's really important to see here that while some trans inclusion is occurring, Again, it's really primarily listed to narratives um, and occasionally activities, which is something that I think is super important to think about from an advocacy perspective, um, because while getting you know, a mention in the narrative is an important start, that really doesn't mean anything for actual impact on programming for trans populations. Whereas when you're starting to get inclusion in things like monitoring and evaluation indicators that have to be reported back on or budgets, I think that's you know, a, a more likely to have actual impact for trans communities. Um, next slide, please. And then just to you know, briefly compare this to the Asia and the Pacific region, you can see here that inclusion is really starting to occur, to occur in most sections of NSPs in most countries. Um, but I just wanted to you know, point out the really um, storied history of trans organizations and communities in a number of these countries that have really been pushing for policy wins for years and years. Um, and I think that's something we can think about when we look at other regions where getting trans inclusion into HIV policy documents is really a newer priority 
starting to learn from, from colleagues in the Asia and the Pacific region and think about how we can invest um, in building capacity of trans organizations in those regions and getting funders to invest in building capacity for trans orgs in those regions. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, very briefly, I just wanted to touch on, you know, we talk about going beyond just a mention of trans people in NSPs. I wanted to talk a little bit about what quality trans inclusion actually looks like. Um, so here's a couple examples from actual NSP texts. Um, you can see in the first example from Malaysia, they've done a really great job of listing trans-specific uh, prevalence estimates on their own. They're not grouped in with MSM. And though, you know, 2014 seems outdated now, the Malaysia NSP was actually published in 2016. Um, and so that was actually really recent. A lot of times because there is so little good data on trans populations, when data is included, it can be decades old. So it's great to see that more recent inclusion. And then in the second example, uh, this comes from the, the Jamaica NSP. Because we really don't have trans data in a lot of places yet, I think they did a really great job of acknowledging that gap, acknowledging that they need to do a better job of collecting that data moving forward, and also acknowledging some of the specific trans vulnerabilities that they can think about while they do collect that data. And so I think that's a great start and would be even better, you know, if you saw follow through on those comments throughout the rest of the NSP. For example, if there was a budget line data related to capturing that trans data for the next NSP. And then finally, the last example I wanted to point to uh, comes from the Haiti NSP, where it's one of their activities that talks about capacity building of community orgs. Uh, and I just wanted to, to point to this as a really positive example that we're starting to see in some of the NSPs um, that you know, they really should be in activities, including trans orgs, including community-led orgs in all of their activities and plannings. And so we really wanna push for more of that and see more of that in NSPs moving forward. Um, and that's really our brief overall summary. And so thank you for your time and I'll pass it back over to Jenny. Great. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, so I think I, you know, just I was just going to wrap up with some key takeaways. And I think um, Elise did a great job of, of highlighting those results. I think the big the big top lines here are that our, our review found that there really is continues to be inconsistent inclusion of trans populations in NSPs globally. We're seeing some great examples, um, but it's far from universal um, with only 8% of, of the plans that we reviewed showing um, trans inclusion in all five of the sections. Uh, there were big geographical differences and, and importantly, uh, inclusion in the sections of the plans that we might think have a little more teeth, have a little more actionable um, items attached to them, like budgets, like m and &E indicators, we're seeing just less trans inclusion um, in those sections of the plans as compared to, um, compared to narrative sections. Uh, and secondly, that I think the other big top line is that every NSP has the opportunity to improve. Um, we definitely found um, plans that had inclusion of and mentioned trans people in narrative sections and in background sections, uh, but not in budget sections. And those plans do have the opportunity to, to, to better include trans people in all of these different parts of the NSP. Um, but even if you are in a country that has really good inclusion of trans people uh, in all of these key sections, there still is opportunity to improve, um, including better investment um, and more recent investment in, in, in trans uh, size estimates or epi data, or working on better disaggregation of targets and budgets, um, either by population, by age group, by subpopulation, et cetera. Um, so I'll just leave us with just a few key recommendations before we move to the other parts of the, um, of the webinar today. And that's what everyone can do. Um, governments can, um, can meaningfully consult KPs um, and trans communities um, in their NSP development process. Uh, we actually developed a best practice guide that was specifically for governments um, that people can um, 
can check out if interested. Uh, international donors play such a key role, and there's so much that can be done um, from the national donor side to provide technical assistance and funding directly to trans communities to do this work themselves or engage in the NSP process. Um, or even in a more heavy handed way, um, international donors can require trans inclusion in size estimates or behavioral studies where they're funding those things. Advocates, of course, um, can continue to fight for visibility and quality inclusion as they, as they always have. Um, I'll, I'll say that we have a bunch of resources that can help out with this. Um, and I've listed them here just for distribution, um, but we will be talking much more about the um, guides that we've developed um, that Gates developed um, in a bunch of languages um, and a plug for our, our manuscript, which highlights these results in, uh, in, uh, in full. And that's it for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And as Jennifer mentioned in that slide, uh, we'll be sharing the link. All registered participants will receive the link and you will be able to find the tools in English, Spanish, Russian, French, Ukrainian, and Thai. And hopefully we'll be able to make them available in many other languages. Uh, I want to remind everyone that you can post your questions or if you want to post a comment, you can use the chat. If you want to post a question for the panelists, you can use the Q&A box. And for now, we're gonna move and we're gonna share a short video with you about the guidelines that has that have, oh, sorry. Um, something always happens, of course. In every country with available data, trans populations are among the most at-risk groups for HIV. In 2017, global HIV prevalence among trans people was approximately 13 times higher than among cisgender adults. Despite this, trans populations are frequently not included in national data collection efforts all recognized by national governments as priority populations in their HIV responses. As a result, meaningful inclusion of trans people in national strategic plans is rare. And this exclusion continues to contribute to poor HIV related health outcomes among the population and to comparatively low levels of trans specific funding and programming. The lack of meaningful engagement also leads to ineffective approaches to HIV programming, creating an enabling environment and leveraging the positive impact of including gender affirming services in increasing the uptake of HIV services, improving economic livelihoods for trans people, addressing hostile legal policies and other priority areas for trans communities are often overlooked. change this, it is important that trans organizations understand and utilize the links between NSP engagement and their existing organizational mission, strategy, and goals. For this, we prepared two guides, one for governments and another for activists. The information comes from our desk review, 45 activist survey responses, interviews with trans activists, government officials and donors, as well as a validation meeting. To share some highlights from our survey findings, we learned that for this work, 71% of organizations believe in the power of building alliances across movements rather than working in isolation. 73% experience financial challenges to attending meetings. While 81% feel government officials in the country coordinating mechanism 
do not understand the challenges that trans people face. 90% are of the opinion that trans engagement will improve through the inclusion of a trans representative in the technical working group and 86% feel that donor mandated and monitored funding will improve engagement while 85% say capacity strengthening and technical HIV information for activists is needed. We found that one big challenge for trans organizations to participate in national strategic plan processes is the low level of community awareness. Let's come up with ways to ensure that we bring our communities with us, that we leave no one behind. We have listened, learned, and come up with a suggested list of actions that your organization can take to start getting involved in this work. Mapping out and strengthening relationships with other key population-led organization, networks and actors, so that we can work collaboratively. Not waiting to be invited to engage in NSP processes, but taking proactive steps like engaging in endorsed letter writing campaigns to demand meaningful engagement. Advocate for and or engage in data collection. There is insufficient data on transport questions. And where there is data, the under-resourcing of responses for trans population is clear. Activists can advocate for and engage in gathering population estimates accurate data on various areas relevant to the HIV response. We invite your organization to read and share our guidelines and work with us to make an impact on an area that has affected trans communities around the world for a very long time. Will you join us? You can download both the guidelines for government and for activists at our website at the link provided below. And that was a short video we prepared for you about the guidelines for governments and for communities. Um, Jennifer and Elise, there was a question if you found any um, good examples of inclusion of uh, trans people in NSPs in Europe. Do you want to take that before we pass to the panelists for discussion? Yeah, I can jump in quickly. Um, so we actually, in, in our five regions, we only looked at um, Eastern Europe. Uh, and so most of them did not really have much in the way of trans inclusion. Uh, Kyrgyzstan did have some examples of very specific trans indicators and targets, um, but that was about it. And no country in the Eastern Europe region uh, we looked at had any epi data at all, um, but we actually didn't include, you know, Western Europe in our review uh, because we were looking at most impacted um, UNAIDS regions. I don't know, Jenny, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, no, that's right. I mean, and I think, um, but, you know, I was reading the, the chat question and, and I think there is still opportunity to improve those plans and include trans people better um, in Western Europe countries as well and just because they're not included in this review doesn't mean that um that there's not opportunities to use these uh guides to, to to improve the next plan so that your yeah your partnership is welcome so thank you very much elise and jennifer and also the comment from axel please do contact us if you want any support we can share some tools and information so that you can improve uh the HIV plan in Belgium. Now we're going to move to the second part of today's webinar, and we have three 
very uh, uh, important guests with us. We have Jay, Clayton, and Ed, and I I'm going to allow each one of them to introduce themselves uh, so that we can have a conversation about uh, the experience and also why is it important to include uh, trans people in NSPs. Jay, why don't you start? Introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Erica. Um, I'm called Jay Molucha. I'm the Executive Director of Femme Alliance Uganda. I'm a trans man. I sit on the board uh, of Trans Network Uganda as the board chair, and I also sit on the board of uh, East Africa Trans Network. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Clayton? Thank you, Erica. Hi, everyone. My name is Clayton. I work here at UNAIDS in Geneva as C a senior advisor for civil society networking as part of the community engagement team. It's a pleasure to be here today joining this webinar. And also Ed. Thank you so much, Erica. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ed Nofin. I'm the technical advisor and key populations working with the Human Rights and Gender Department in the Global Fund. What a great way to commem commemorate World Aid today. Thank you so much for the invitation to us. Thank you very much, Jay, Ed, and Clayton. Uh, I want to start with Jay, of course, in Gates webinars, communities always go first. Um, Jay, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in the engagement of trans people in NSP processes and why do you consider it important? Uh, thank you so much, Erica. Um, I'm going to speak, but mostly I will be referring to my country, but I also know that in some countries they are facing the same challenges. Yeah. It is important to include trans people in the development of national HIV strategic plan due to the fact that we understand our HIV related issues as well as the most appropriate HIV tailored programs. If the NSP is inclusive of trans issues, then this national tool will further influence the promotion, recognition and implementation of the universal health coverage in Uganda, especially looking at the fact that trans persons will have access to the HIV services that are appropriate to our needs, when, when to access them and where. Um, also health facilities uh, will therefore embrace inclusivity, equitability, accessibility, availability and affordability of HIV related services in relation to the universal health coverage. The universal health coverage components will be put in practice at different levels, such as the full spectrum of health service, health service coverage of the entire population, financial protection from direct payment for health services. I can uh, give an example of that. Eh? Uh, much as the HIV services in uh, government facilities seem to be free, trans persons may not be able to access those services due to different perception in relation to our gender identity and other interlinking identities. So we end up opting for private hospitals that offer chargeable services, which is really so hectic and uh, unaffordable to some trans persons. Uh, the NSP mainly builds on the availability of HIV related data and prevention assessment in the country. However, it should be noted that there is limited or no data for trans persons in relation to HIV in the country. Regardless, the authenticity of the accepted data from the implementing partners is highly doubted due to the fact that trans persons are not meaningfully involved in the designing and implementation of such interventions that directly benefit us. However, some trans organizations and like-minded CSOs in Uganda to a lesser extent have conducted evidence-based HIV related assessment for trans persons, but unfortunately the data is not recognized due to the unfavorable policies in the country. Um, when we look at the Ministry of Health in Uganda recently published facts on HIV and AIDS in Uganda, 
2020 based on data ending 31st December 2020 for the period of 2010 to 2020. They mentioned that they had recorded a tremendous improvement in the fight against HIV and AIDS epidemic. It was also mentioned that Uganda is among the eight countries in the world that had fully achieved the 1990 targets by the end of 2020. It should be noted that the Ministry of Health in Uganda fully implements the objectives in the NSP, yet in the previous years, trans persons were not recognized, unlike in the current NSP, where we are at least mentioned among the priority population. Just that is what is mentioned in the, in the current NSP. Much as the current NSP mentions trans persons among the priority population, the objectives are not directly linked to our HIV related needs. And yet the trans community has a high HIV prevalence rate. Uh, to me, I think donors should fund trans community led and best research to ensure eff effective, comprehensive and appropriate data. This data will fully guide the development of, the, of a responsive NSP that's implementation of HIV programs that are tailored to trans needs. In regards to leaving no one behind in the fight against HIV and AIDS, trans persons need to be engaged at all levels because this hasn't been done, especially uh, like I'm a witness and it hasn't been done at all. And we wonder where this, these people, when they come up with that data, we don't know where they always get it. Um, I'm glad to say that through GET, we are getting some funding to make sure that we push for more inclusion of trans in the NSP. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jay, um, for sharing with us and, and you know that experience from Uganda and all the work that you are doing, the importance, and also the challenges and barriers the trans community face in your country, but also in several countries around the world. We're gonna continue with Ed, and Ed, uh, you know, being from CRG, being from the Global Fund, uh, uh, we want to hear what's your perspective about this topic. Sure, thank you so much, Erica. Um, and lovely to see you all. I'll try to address some of the comments as well that you have provided in the chat and in the Q&A. Uh, and just to start off by saying, um, agreeing with uh, Jen's, uh, message about how important this, uh, the national strategic plan is. And for the Global Fund, um, it's extremely important as we expect programs to be designed on the basis of the robust cost of NSP, uh, that should include um, key populations. Uh, but as Erica mentioned, this is not always the case. Uh, and there's so much work that we need to do um, to make sure um, that is being appropriately uh, paid attention to. Um, Equally important is to make sure that the um, trans communities are engaged in the development of the NSP. So therefore, in our funding processes, we consider NSP development processes as one of the processes um, that we support uh, meaningful engagement. Because if the NSP fully reflects the full spectrum of needs uh, and reflects lived, um, their lives and lived realities, uh, that would eventually inform the service packet that needs to be provided. So therefore we um, partner with groups like GATE um, to, through our CIC initiative to support meaningful engagement uh, in the design uh, of the NSP, in the design of program, as, as well as in the oversight of the implementation of the program, for example, as part of the country coordinating mechanism. It is also very important to make sure that we have funding for trans-led organizations to provide this uh, HIV related services and help to address some of the barriers to improve access for trans communities for um, gender affirming care alongside HIV specific services. And this is where I do think it's important to not use an excuse of not having nationally adequate site estimates for trans as a basis for not funding a uh, program for transgender. Uh, because we do know that even for um, the survey to be conducted among trans, you need a small scale infrastructure of services to reach trans communities. 
And this is what we are trying to do and advocate for, and therefore you know, leveraging some of our uh, investment uh, to strengthen strategic information to lay the groundwork for trans programming. I did that working through uh, community groups to conduct needs assessment among trans communities, uh, doing programmatic mapping uh, in, you know, in lieu of not having a population site estimate, uh, which is something that we have continued to uh, really advocate for. And Alex, you asked the questions about, you know, have there been any rigorous work done to assess um, the correlation between a reflection of trans in NSP and the program? We haven't done that, um, but at the same time, we recognize that there are um, the reverse trend is also true that even if the countries do not have a robust um, inclusion of trans and NSP, we can see some small scale of services being proposed. Uh, and this is thanks to the process uh, that we have gone through in grant making when the technical review panel do recommend that you need to start something uh, as a basis for you know, doing um, and advocating for the NSP inclusion. Uh, and this is to note that uh, so, so much work still have to be done. We see today from the UNH report and Clayton can talk about it, that we have 15 million uncounted key populations, even from the countries that have uh, conducted the population by estimate. So I think uh, there's so much work to be done. Um, and lastly, what I want to highlight is also the point that Ellis made which is NSP inclusion is the start of our advocacy, uh, ensuring that there are supporting document and framework like guidelines, standard operating procedures to help trans to translate that aspiration uh, uh, that is included in NSP, making sure there's clear definition of populations, element of service packages, uh, differentiated uh, based on gender and age, frequency of services across HIV and health services spectrums as well as a role, of trans-led community in service delivery and advocacy would be equally important and crucial. So congratulations, uh, Erica and colleagues from AMFA uh, for this critical piece of work and for engaging us in, 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 in this exercise. We look forward to working with all of you uh, to make sure that um, we have services uh, that are available and accessible of, of high quality for trans communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. And you know, I know I want to go back to the question that Alex uh, posted. You know, it's really important that we have robust uh, NSPs with inclusion, and and having uh, funders and and organizations like the Global Fund, like Pepper, making sure that this has happened in a robust way and in meaningful engagement would be important uh, for the future. Um, I, I have to add this comment because in many countries around the world, including the country where I come from originally, Belize, the, the Global Fund provides that unique space where communities actually have a voice. So trans people can actually sit down with decision makers, with politicians, with the Ministry of Health, even in settings where you're criminalized, where we're criminalized, and it provides the opportunity to work and advance in many areas. So hopefully this will continue working and improving. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Clayton, we're going to move to you and UNAIDS and what's your uh, perspective and what do you think about NSP, in, uh, in inclusion of trans people in NSP? But also I want, if it's possible that you touch a little bit, you know, we know UNAIDS provides a lot of assistance at country level to develop national strategic plans. What can be done better and how can everyone, uh, you know, assist uh, UNAIDS and work together to make sure trans people are meaningfully engaged. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica. And I would like to start uh, congratulating you, Gate and Anfar for this work, for the, the research and for the, the launch of the guidelines. I think you were putting, uh, not only putting a light on the, on the gaps and problems that we have on the exclusion of trans uh, communities in, in national strategic plans, but also providing some uh, great uh, advices, recommendations, and suggestions on how uh, governments and communities and other stakeholders can and must act to, to, to address 
uh, these gaps. Um, I would like to also say that I think why uh, UNAIDS consider is important the inclusion of trans, trans communities. And I am saying both the inclusion in the documents, like the inclusion of trans issues in the documents, but also the meaningful engagement of communities in all process related to the, to the responses at the national, regional, and, and global level. I think these this are very much uh, connected. And one is the, the issue on data. Uh, uh, we, as, you, as your reveal, the reveal that you, the GATE and FAR did, and uh, the report that UNH launched yesterday that Ed referred to, we still have a lot of gaps, unfortunately, on the data on key populations. And we, the, the report that, uh, that was launched yesterday shows that uh, many countries appear to, to underestimate the size of key populations yet. And we have this analysis that more than 15 million of people that would benefit from prevention, treatment, and testing uh, programs, they are unaccounted uh, in size estimates of reporting countries. So I think one important inclusion on this is the inclusion of and the, the, the support and, and funding for uh, trans-led uh, research and monitoring also can, can help address this, this data gap. Uh, but And despite, despite the fact that we have this data gap, uh, we can say that we have enough evidence that shows the high level of uh, vulnerability to, to HIV that uh, trans communities face in all regions of the, of the world. And we also have evidence showing uh, that trans people experience uh, significant levels of stigma, discrimination, violence that will all contribute to uh, lower levels of access to, to HIV services and, and other health, health services. So we have this uh, gap in data, we have this high level vulnerability, and then as you, you show in the, in the analysis, we have this exclusion from national strategic plan. So it's, this is not, uh, we can see clearly that this is, that this is not, uh, this will not work at, at the end because you have a population that is with high vulnerability and exclusion in the, in the national strategic plans. So, and I would like also to highlight one data that was, is very much aligned with the, this data that you, you showed about the, the, the systematic review of the national strategic plans that we, we have in our report, uh, uh, data from the National uh, Committeements and Policy Instrument that about the participation of key populations in developing national policies and guidelines that are related to their health. So this is reported by countries. And among uh, one, uh, 144 countries that reported, uh, 54 reported that transgender people have not participated in the discussion or, or strategic discussion and, and the, the construction of guidelines related to, to their health or to their life. So this, this is a problem that we, we, we really need to, to address. And we have been trying to, to work uh, in country level to support countries in really guaranteeing the inclusion and the meaningful inclusion of key populations in all phases uh, of the process. And we consider in our report, uh, bring this, this key message that uh, communities really need to be treated as full partners and trans communities really should be treated as full partners and involved in governing, designing, uh, planning, budgeting, uh, monitoring. And they need, of course, the technical and financial support to do so. We cannot say, we cannot talk about uh, empowered communities, empowered trans communities without funding and without uh, civil, with, without space, without a minimum of uh, civic space to, to raise their voices and participate. And UNAIDS in country level is working 
uh, in, in different regions, supporting communities, but also working in governments, advocating for more uh, participation of key populations in all the processes that are related to their health and, and lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clayton. And in the chat, I have both the link where all of you can download and access um, the guide for governments and for activists in English, Spanish, French, Russian, Ukrainian, and Thai, and hopefully more languages coming soon. There's also the video. You can download it there. And also we're going to be uploading the uh, review that was conducted and what and the results from the review. We will also share the slides that have been shared today. So if you want to use it, Please, this is documents to distribute widely, no need to ask permission there for use. We want you to use them uh, and to use them proactively. Um, uh, I don't see any additional questions for anyone. So uh, it has been a, an amazing uh, panel, an amazing webinar. But before we go, I want to ask all of you, Elise, Jennifer, um, Clayton, Ed, and Jay, if you would uh, be able to share a, a possible uh, message uh, for donors, for governments on what they can do to improve the engagement of trans people in NSPs, what would that short message be? Whoever is ready can start. I don't want to call and put somebody on the spot so fast. I can go. Um, I would just say, you know, build relationships with the, the trans organizations in country now. They have the knowledge, um, they have the partners, uh, they know what, what needs to be done and how programming should be delivered and how they can best input uh, into these strategic planning documents, NSPs and other HIV policy documents. So engage them now and, and give them the resources they need to engage with you because they may need additional support to, to, to be able to give you that input. But that would be my answer. Thank you, Elise. I will go next. I think um, uh, it all starts from donors because donors are the ones who fund the government, donors are the ones who fund our research. So I would urge donors always, when they are funding, they should also uh, consider, because we have seen a lot of, uh, like in my country, data is nowhere because we are not funded to do the research. So we urge donors to come on board and make sure that we do our research and to follow up on uh, ministries or entities that they fund to see that whatever the funds that they give to these entities, they make sure they are utilized in the right way in order to engage the trans communities. And we also need our research to be involved as in they should not, donors should not just sit and watch and think everything is going uh, properly. They should make sure that the funding that is given to entities is followed the way they asked for it. Like it should be implemented the way they asked for it. That is when we shall get meaningful engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jay. And you touched on something very important about funding. And you know, in Kate's website, you can also find uh, two reports about the state of trans organizing that have been conducted over time. And one of the most shocking findings in that is that more than 50% of trans organizations around the world have an yearly budget of less than $10,000. And yet we do a lot of work. So consider the great work that is being done and the little funding available. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Jennifer, Clayton, Ed, any last message? I, I, can, I can go. Uh, sorry, Jennifer, do you wanna go? Uh, 
uh, I would say that we have uh, now uh, in face of COVID and uh, the story of HIV uh, has shown us that we have a lot of successful stories from all regions of the world on how organizations that are led by communities and that are led by trans community can really support countries in responding to, to any pandemic. So because these organizations are more trusted, they can reach the population, some communities that traditional services uh, say that are difficult to reach. So investing in, in trans-led organizations is really uh, a smart investment in the, for the AIDS response and to end AIDS and to end inequalities and pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Great. Yeah, I agree with what everything is that's been said. I, I guess I would add to that um, funders are they're sit in such a unique place um, to really give to give credibility to an organization and to work that's already happening, that's already good. Um, and they can have this ability to shine a light on a group that's already doing such good work. And so I think um, that extra support can mean so much and can go so far. And as you're saying, Eric, I mean, $10,000, I mean, and these organizations are, are operating and running so much work on that. And so I think there's just, just the, the return on investment there is just huge. Uh, and there's this also this opportunity for international donors um, to share cross-country learnings. I think they, they sit in this place where they might be partnering and funding groups in different areas. And, um, and so there is also this um, organizing role um, that they can play, that they can uh, share best practices from different parts of the world uh, to really for good. So I think um, sitting in that unique place is something really important and, um, and, and a lot more can be done in that space too, so. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Ed, uh, last words. And also, there's a question in the Q&A that you might want to address to see if there's a possible answer. Is there a cost estimate investment case for bridging, bridging the key population data gap in global fund eligible countries through key population led research? Wow, it's, it's such a big question at the end of the session. <laughs> um i mean the easy easy answer is uh currently that uh, there is none um but uh as, as you might already know um the global fund is going through a replenishment process again uh where the investment case will need to be made uh so that process will start shortly and as you know the us is hosting the next replenishment so we hope to see a much clearer articulation of how much it takes to really reaching you know the funding gap for key population which we know is quite significant uh, but in terms of the just the fun to um um the the questions that i agree with all the panelists erica and um one thing that i think is crucial is to hold um technical partners fund funders and national stakeholders accountable for their commitment uh for addressing the, the health needs of transgender uh, and using evidence such as this uh, to really come to these agency and say, you know, have we done enough? Why are we not uh, doing more to ensure trans inclusion in the support that we provide to countries? And the same question would apply to national stakeholders, Ministry of Health, who are leading uh, the process of um, revising NSP. So we hope to be a much more robust mobilization around that. Second is that what we have learned through the years of working and supporting community is that meaningful engagement requires resources. Uh, it's not enough just to provide a space for trans communities to be on the country coordinating mechanism, but it requires strategic support and investment to ensure that the capacity, the knowledge, the expertise, and peer-to-peer -peer support to influence the processes so that uh, that process translates into a more effective um, investment. So I think donors and funders need to take that into account. And lastly, on the funding to translate organizations, fully agree with Clayton and colleagues here, and Jennifer, 10,000, I can't imagine. This is the area where our strategy that has just been adopted, uh, highlighted so much work that needs, we need to do something really radically different to ensure funding flows to the community-led, KP-led, including trans-led organizations. Uh, and, and this is a, a work in progress for the Global Fund, but we 
completely agree that this, we need to rethink about how do we provide more uh, increased and sustainable support to try and let organizations who's at the forefront of uh, response to HIV. Thank you, Erica. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you, Elise, Jennifer, Jay, Clayton, for joining us today. Thank you for our attendees who uh, came in a very busy day to join us in the webinar. I've posted my email. I also posted the link in the chat. If anyone from our attendees would like more resources, would like more information, please do send us an email. We'll be gladly uh, to send it your way and have follow-up conversations. Alex, of course, uh, looking forward to having conversations with you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you too. Great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.